Good morning, everyone. Uh, our guest speaker for today's seminar is Dr. Amir Kadai. Uh, Dr. Kadai is currently working as a senior manager in transportation network design and optimization at Canada Post. He's working on establishing a new supply chain for the e commerce network of Canada Post. The title of his presentation today is E commerce last night delivery capacity management. So, without further ado, please welcome me and uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Kadai. Thank you, Laura, thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Matt, for having me here today. It's a great opportunity for me to talk about and uh, about this unique problem of the postal industry, and specifically North America in Canada Post and EU, USPS. Before I go there, I'll start some biography where I started my journey in uh, 2000 in uh, in Cameron Polytechnic as a bachelor's student. I had lots of hair there at that time. And then graduating in the last 18 years, I lost one after each other till I you see now we here. And uh, I have to be honest, quietly in the last uh, 10 years, which I did my PhD in Concordia, and then after that, uh, uh, had the great opportunity of working for uh, one of the best company in Canada, Canada Post. I lost them and gave me like a lots of challenges and, um, and uh, material to feed my brain more than anything else. I lost them faster and faster in an exponential way. Uh, I came to Canada in 2005 and then I did my master at the University of Ottawa and then in 2007 I started doing PhD, finished my PhD in the supply chain area. A little bit far from the transportation, but not too far. And mostly my focus was around cost management with supply chain. So how am I going to control my cost and revenue across the chain? And my research was more about how can I model the problem of the order fulfillment based on more realistic information, not based on high level coefficients or assumptions that we do with the cost. So basically, looking at the, for us, for most of the engineers, is we model the problem based on our operational parameters, and then we come back and after that we go to the accounting system and tell them that, guys, I need costs associated to this, or I need costs associated to that, and they look at us and say, we never measure such a thing, and so what we're gonna do? Oh, get a percentage of this cost and that will represent what you're looking for. So we do a massive optimization simulation practice. We're trying to be like on the 99.9% of the accuracy, but what we feed as a cost information to our objective function in our model is all based on assumptions. So my PhD was trying to find a way to connect these uh, Counting information and this, and, uh, that is available for the decision making process and, and build this optimization model based on that. I was lucky enough that as soon as I graduated, I applied for a couple of jobs here and there, and by coincidence, I ended up taking kind of the post. And when I arrived there, I, was, uh, I started as a logistics engineer, and that was uh, like the first place they gave me an interview. And, but coincidentally, it was the right place for me to start. And then I figured out that they have a massive problem of managing their cost across their network. And what was happening in general was the volume of the letter mail was declining at 10 to 15 person year over year at that time. And they were not sure that how they can shape the company gradually and be ready to be disappeared or downsized forever. With, uh, because it was not sustainable. So they were looking at their attrition, so we're going to lose 10,000 people in the next couple of years, so we have to just come up with the cost, so downside, downside, downside. And I was an engineer that was responsible to help them to downsize their network. Okay, this facility, maybe we can consolidate them with the other facility from the operations perspective, or this uh, distribution center, we don't need it anymore, downsizing it. Those trucks are underutilized, try to merge them. Those are the type of the activity we were doing. But something happened, which is, uh, was like, a, I think, a fortune to kind of post. And in this process of declining the 
volume of the letter mail before actually kind of the post is become successful in downsizing a network, suddenly a new problem came in, and it was a uh, expansion of e-commerce delivery. And kind of post suddenly came to a mode of, okay, I have a letter mail going down that I have to downsize my network, and I have a, a new demand coming up that I have to potentially answer that because they, I can see it as a public obligation and serving Canadian through a better service. So I'll start to expand it. So at the same time that you downsize the network, you want to expand the network. But there are certain elements that are slightly make this problem uh, more challenging. And that was not obvious at the beginning of the case when we started that journey. And I was lucky enough to be part of that. One of them was the, the cost subsidization elements. So kind of post network was built around letter mail. All these 550 depots across the country, thousands thousands of the nodes up in the rural area, all the buildings, all the delivery agents, all the static routing of the delivery agents because your letter carriers is every day the same letter carrier that comes to your address. So it's not like a like FedEx or UPS model that so I don't have a volume here today, I'm not going to go to that address. It's all about the same guy doing the same job every day. And all that massive infrastructure and uh, been built and been paid by Letterman. The And it's easy to justify that, okay, I'm going to that address, uh, so to deliver my Letterman, to deliver my uh, on address admin or address admin, which we call it these days, uh, smart mail. As so many people, they call it junk mail, but I'll call it a smart mail today. <laughs> uh, needs to be delivered, so it doesn't matter that I'm at that point and I'm going to walk to the door of the guy. So there's a packet in my bag, I'll drop that in. How much does it cost for the last month delivery? doesn't cost anything. Because I already have to go there because of other product. But the question becomes that if the other product is starting to be removed from your network, who will pay for that last step and last mile? So there are two problems. The problem is around the, at the beginning. The problem was only about last mile. Gradually, the other problems came in that we we're going to talk about it, but for now, focusing on that part. So better mail started going down. We had a problem to, deliver, to pay for the delivery. And so kind of started to decline and then started to inform uh, uh, or announce negative margin or loss. The other problem that they, we were dealing with was uh, non-transferable capacity. So letter mail operation and parcel operations, they're not, there are some elements in their sort process that are very close to each other, but they're not, it's not fully transferable. I cannot use the machinery and equipment that I have in the letter mail operation to sort parcel on it necessarily. There, there are certain gray area, like for example for document, that you can use it interchangeably, but not for big parcel or big items. So I have a massive floor space area that I dedicated for the letter mail operations, and I need that because they're not necessarily function of or defined based on volume, they're defined based on the point of call, based on the addresses. It's a very static floor space, I cannot remove one slot or one cube that I have for the sort in the one facility because there's no volume in it, because even one piece goes there, it's a representative of one address in Canada. But at the same time, I want to fit the parcel into that area, which is a hard thing to do. So, and then from transportation perspective, same story. Like, yes, I remove 200 letter mail from the system, in order to justify to, to replace that with one parcel from the transportation perspective. This is really a conversion factor if you're looking for something. Two to 250 more or less. The next challenge we come to the product margin. So in the past, we had a healthy margin of letter manual. We were delivering it at 66 cents a couple of years ago before they increased it to a dollar. And Close to 70% of it was a pure margin because the process is very automated process. And uh, floor space was, it requires less floor space, so we were making a good healthy margin out of it. But parcel business, 
doesn't, special e-commerce business, doesn't come with the same healthy margin. Somebody raised his hand and the company said, okay, we have to charge customer more. And because when we're selling product at a retail counter in Shopper Dragma, we're charging 20 bucks, 30 bucks, $15 for a delivery an item. Why we are letting uh, a cheap delivery for uh, customers like a Gap, Amazon, Best Buy, Walmart, and uh, we let them to advertise online that, well, oh, it's free charge, get it guys, order it, and then they have to pay us more, and then we will have it stand up. Which we come back at the end of this story, I'll, I'll park this points here, and then we'll come back to it later to see that why we cannot ask them to pay more. The next thing that came in it was about the collaboration, and supply chain collaboration. In the leather mail environment that Carla Cruz was dealing with it before, we were more or less uh, our main customers, our main shippers, were more or less big companies that they are sharing the same culture, same values, same pace. And collaborating with those guys were like more feasible and more constructive because of they were very similar with kind of posts from the way and how they in, how they manage their environment. Banks, public sectors, governmental organizations, they were the major uh, contributor to our revenue. But now suddenly we go from the companies that are very similar to us in terms of the behavior, in terms of their business model, in terms of their pace, to a company like Amazon that is full of tech savvy, keep changing things every other day, and how am I going to connect these two extreme with each other and to come up to a collaborative model? And without the collaboration, not a, neither they can win the game nor we can win the game with them. So, if I go, go further, I just want to give uh, some background on kind of post when it started. You see in 1763, the first uh, postal service established in Canada. We went further, Canada Post Office created 16 years before the Confederation. We were at the age that we were sorting mail on the train. So we were, uh, all the facility, all the manual, because there was no automated, all the manual sorted was happening at the train when they were going from East Coast to West Coast at the same time. And uh, I have, my boss has seen my boss is like me in this company for 30 something years. And he was telling me that the other day that his first boss started as one of those train uh, uh, sort guy. That when he joined the company like 30 years ago, his boss was about to retire. That, that guy was the guy that started before that as a train sorting guy. So I never seen those guys, but at least I can tell you that I've seen a guy that knows those guys. Then uh, we had the. Uh, Confederation and creation of the Canada Post Office Network, then started to go for the airmail, and then the first one happened between Toronto and Montreal. I have uh, started to, in 1960s, started to establish the network, really. And that's something that we inherited from that moment. And the backbone of that network still exists in Canada Post. It's really hard to change it. So when we decided to establish a postal service between Toronto and Montreal in one day, and we did that 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And that still is in company. And we run the business with that thought process and that part of it. Is it the correct or is not the correct thing? That's another story. And uh, officially, kind of post become a crown corporation in the 1980s, which was from there till 2000-ish, uh, 2005, it was a glory moment. Network was established. Automation was there, and automation started to evolve and evolve and evolve. The efficiency was there, and there was not major logistics and supply chain challenge. It was all saving was coming from transferring a intense labor of the sorts to a machinery. So it was all everybody was shining. It was a glory moment, and until the time that we reached the 2005, 2006, that started the erosion of the determined happening. I have a video, I'll let you guys watch this video first. That is, I uh, got it from the kind of post website. The postal system as we know it today evolved over decades as a convenient and low cost way to communicate and receive and pay household bills. The rise of digital communication.
patrons has provided a faster and cheaper way for Canadians to do many things online that they used to do by mail. That means less mail every year. In 2012, we delivered 1 billion fewer pieces of mail to Canadians than we did in 2006. The Conference Board of Canada studied the situation and released their report in April of 2013. Their findings? Without fundamental changes, Canada Post would face a loss of $1 billion a year by 2020. Change was not an option, it was a must. But it was also an opportunity to lay a new foundation to better serve Canadians in the digital world. So just to tell you, like exactly 2011 is exactly the day that they joined Canada Post. So it was a time that the change was must. That in mind, Canada Post held a series of important discussions over the summer. We sat down and talked face to face with a wide range of people in 46 communities across the country and asked them what they wanted from their postal service. We also heard from Canadians online and through the mail. Those discussions have shaped our plan for the future. Canadians told us they're leading busy lives. They're juggling demanding schedules. They're not home during the day when the mail comes. Their mailing habits have changed. It's easier to go online to pay their bills. It's also easier to shop online and have their purchases delivered to their home, or skip the lineups in order to driver's license and other forms of government identification through the mail. Canadians see an important role for Canada Post going forward. They understand the challenges we face, but expect us to overcome them without turning to their tax dollars for funding. And we agree. And there's something cute here that is, Canada Post was ready even to become a smaller company. That's why they came with an idea of e-post. They were like, okay, we're gonna lose these guys regardless, let's find a way to not be too small. And they accepted that, so they were even contributing in the decline, so we were going to the uh, banks, to the government, and said, guys, why you don't switch to the to the uh, e-post e instead of the letter mail and then uh, come to our channel because we wanted, we were thinking that, oh yeah, we're gonna lose them regardless, so it's better us to make them dependent on us. So it was the fact that they accepted at the point. Great. The new postal system that Canada Post is launching provides Canadians with the postal services they want and need now and in the future. And it will return Canada Post to financial sustainability by 2019. We are launching five initiatives that together form the foundation of the new postal system designed to serve busy Canadians and meet their changing needs no matter where they live. The one-third of Canadian households that receive mail at their door will be converted to community mailbox delivery over the next five years. Unlike a household mailbox, community mailboxes offer individually locked mail compartments and locked parcel compartments. They're ideal for securely and conveniently receiving online orders and identification mail. Two-thirds of Canadians already receive their mail and parcels through some form of community mailbox, lobby mailbox, or rural mailbox, and will see no change. A new tiered approach to pricing means that stamp prices within Canada will increase. Those who buy stamps and booklets or coils will pay 85 cents per stamp, with discounts for customers that use the mail most. The cost of sending a letter from one part of the country to another will remain a good value, with the new pricing structure taking effect on March 31st, 2014. Canada Post will strengthen its retail network by launching more franchise postal outlets in stores across Canada. We will seek new partnerships with local retail businesses that are conveniently located in the communities they serve. We will look for retailers that offer benefits that customers appreciate such as better parking and longer hours. Franchise post offices also allow customers to do more shopping in one place and are ideal for busy on-the-go Canadians. Internal changes to our operations will improve the flow of parcels and mail through our network and out to Canadians while helping to reduce costs. Examples of changes include fully utilizing faster, more computerized sorting equipment at our plants, Continuing to motorize delivery routes so that one employee can deliver both mail and parcels at the same time, and improving scanning abilities so that you can track your parcels throughout the process. Canada Post will continue its efforts to address labor costs across the organization through collective bargaining. As well, with thousands of employees <laughs> to retire in the next five years, Canada Post has an opportunity to hire only who we need 
to serve the future needs of Canadians. A leaner workforce will allow us to operate with more flexibility so we can respond more quickly to our customers' needs as they continue to change in the digital era. Together, these five initiatives create a new postal system that will not only serve you, our customers, better, but also put Canada Post on solid financial ground. Four of the five initiatives alone are worth between $700 million and $900 million a year. That means no taxpayer money. Canada Post looks forward to continuing to serve all Canadians, and we look forward to serving you better now and in the future. Welcome to the new Canada Post. When I saw this video first time, I thought like uh, I'm ready now to fly. It's like a, the, give me the imagination that I'm in the airplane, and that's one of like typical to one of those videos that they show that I'll make sure that you close your seatbelt before helping the passengers on your side and stuff. So that gives you like a little bit of also the environment and talk process <laughs> of kind of a post, okay? With the video that you see, like think about it like that. It's a little bit different between this video and the video that comes from Amazon. This is a video that shows the business in FedEx. So now I want to go to lots of ambiguity that it turned out around me that why should I do all of this once still to a, to a reality. And yes, they, we had a very good direction, which was the document that uh, is available on the online as well, the, the take all a five point action plan that they were talking about. And then uh, we got some principal into it and et cetera, et cetera. And then what happened was, we came back and said, yeah, we need to convert everybody to come to mailbox because that's significantly reduced the walk in the, for the delivery, which we know what happened to it after uh, the new government came to place. We said, oh, okay, we need to increase our stamp, which will basically, we couldn't uh, increase it because of certain regulation for a long time. It required, like, uh, there were also some hesitation about, oh, if we increase it, we may lose more customers, how much we should increase it, all those economical aspects around price elasticity, etc., which ultimately would come to a recommendation of a dollar. This store expansion, it's suddenly you come back and say, that, okay, on one side I'll try to reduce cost, but this store expansion will, will mean more investment and uh, more money and more cost added to the system. So, you see, now you come gradually to the point that, okay, at the same time, I have to downsize my network, reduce my cost, and, the, and increase my visibility. How that is possible, how they are syncing together. Then they come back, which is a part that I got involved more and more and more and more, which was the streamlining the operations. And when you listen to the, even the video, it was more and more around determined operation. Still, what are we going to do with the parcel? And if we want to invest in the parcel, where the money going to come from to invest in the parcel? For, because ultimately they're looking at it, they said, okay, I want to put a new sorter here, $50 million, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to run this much parcel on it. And then at the end of the game, I have to have a payback in 10 years or 15 years. But if the margin on the parcel is not a healthy margin, if there are lots of uncertainty about the business of e-commerce, how am I going to justify this sort of from financial perspective? So you come back again, you do more investment around your letter mail operation to reduce in the cost associated with that, but still, you don't know still how we're going to expand our parcel model, business model differently in a, in a more, and develop it in an agile way. Not going to our, not mimicking our traditional model of the parcel that, okay, people go on the counter, order something, stamp on it, and take it out how the scanning should work, how the processor should to work, how the sort should be uh, adjusted, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to make it cheaper. Because people traditionally think that, okay, we have always, we had always parcel business in Canada Post. So we do the same thing. But there is a difference between a parcel that comes from a near ink as an occasional cheaper on eBay, and a parcel that comes from Amazon. We always say that not every ball is a soccer ball. You cannot shoot the bowling ball with the same matter that you play with the soccer ball. So it's going to hurt you. And you, and as a as a company, kind of post try to involve and figuring out how am I going to do that differently in order to reduce this cost and increase our margin gradually. 
And there was also discussion around attrition. But the problem, the major problem is, on a streamlining the operation, the solution is always into the weeds. There is a big challenge around evolving the process. The second problem, when we got through this, and it's hard to get people more and more involved into that thought process, but the second problem that was into this was not only we have to look at this problem from the cost decreasing model, we have to also try to figure out how I'm going to increase the revenue out of it. So you have, if you want to make it viable and you want to answer the growth that we see in the online retailer that I have a couple of them in here for the US market and I have the next slide showing that the growth that is happening was happening in uh, in sort of 2015-ish across the country in the different geographical area. Then I come back to the point that, okay, I need to reduce the cost, which is important, so I'm gonna go around optimization techniques, I'm gonna go around measuring things correctly, I'm gonna go around finding a way to define a more automated process. But at the same time, the bucket is so, the market is so naive and competitive that I have to find a way also to make money out of it more and more. But how am I gonna make the money? How can I charge my carrier? And, uh, and then, uh, with a, with a higher rate. How can I go to Amazon and tell them, hey, by the way, the rate that you're giving to me is not a healthy rate. I need to charge you $15 for delivery. I need to charge you $10 for delivery because I need to invest in my infrastructure and automation to reduce my processing cost. So, and that solution is not coming anymore only from Canada Post. Now you come back and looking at the process at the supply chain level and to trying to figure out that how we're gonna, in a collaborative environment, how we're gonna um, build a model that is win-win and, uh, and be able to follow things in the correct way. So that's really what I focus in general for my uh, research. And I'm um, doing it in collaboration of the Health Risk School of Management. Um, let me just make it uh, the right size. So we talk about the background and motivations of it, that the is <coughs> growing. We talk about the letter Melarusian and then the fact that parcel is going up, but guess what, the revenue is going down at the same time. We came and said, so how am I gonna manage this problem? And now I'm going to go and talk about a little bit about the nature of the e-commerce business in the in the kind of post network and in overall in the in the retail industry and in the postal industry. So I, I mentioned that that not every ball is a soccer ball, and what do I mean by this is e-commerce delivery is subject to low cost because if you increase the cost, you will reduce the volume, so you will reduce your competitiveness. By nature, you cannot go back to the customers and say, hey, Amazon, I want to charge you more. Because if they start charging more, that means that Amazon going to charge customers more. And that means customers going to migrate from the online shopping to the, to, the, uh, to the store to buy their product. So the business will be removed or diminished in general. So it's not a case that we can play with. But there are other challenges also that comes with the e-commerce, especially for a company that are not that quick and responsive to the to the adjusting its capacity in transportation and in the labor and in the sort. E-commerce has a, is subject to a massive variation on a daily basis. There is a there is an advertisement online and there is a sales going on and suddenly you will receive a, a truck of diapers at the at the Canada Post facility to sort them for national to all destinations. Next day that ad is not there and you're not going to have that volume. So how can I manage this fluctuation in a, in a company that is unionized and, they're, and, they're, uh, and then transportation network of it is, uh, is being managed by third parties mostly. The response time is extremely short and Gada Post cannot answer to that. 
So the disruptions always happen. The funny thing is, the disruptions create by customers that are not having a big margin, but they're the one that has a higher voice in the company. So when they come in, you kind of post, or any post all like US, yes, they try to manage that volume somehow. But at the cost of deteriorating the service on the smaller guy, that normally they have better margin on their products. So they're not gonna go and say that, hey, Amazon, we fail on your truck that is full of diaper boxes. Actually, we're gonna go after these 5,000 small shippers that I collect them through my retail network, or I collect them through my DCF channels, and then I will process them. So I will sacrifice my service in them in order to make sure that my big guy is happy. So I'll promote a bad behavior or uh, to the smaller guy as well, and not giving them proper support. But the, the interruption also doesn't happen necessarily at the originating site that they receive the mail. It could happen across the network because the noise will be transferred all the way through the other facilities that they receive the mail in the next step. So when I have an interruption in Toronto, six hours after that, I will get the same interruption in Montreal because of the transit time that exists. So how am I going to build a network in a way that this is an interruption be able to absorb and it will be flattened when I'm going to the network? Who should be responsible to, to do this process? This is from the cost perspective. One element that came to attention part of this problem was uh, we're looking at a network as a, like an inventory model, the sort capacity as an inventory model across the country. And think about the intermodal, uh, intermodal sort of uh, design for our network or for the capacity that we have. So basically, how am I going to transfer a capacity of one node to a capacity of to, to another node in another window. So think about it as a, as a quick example, which was a very successful case and implemented in Canada Post, was we sort mail in Mississauga, which is a major facility of Canada Post. 30, 40% of this mail is needs to go to Montreal and get processed in Montreal after processing in Toronto. If I process everything to Mississauga Depot, then uh, Mississauga uh, facility, after six hours after that, and I finish, let's say, around 11-ish at night, around, four, around 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning, I would have a massive amount of mail coming to a Montreal facility to be processed and get delivered the same day. That creates a bottleneck in the second process and requires a capacity expansion and a small window of the sort in the Montreal building. Now, we want to make sure that that model will... Now, we want to see that how we're going to connect these two to each other. So the main, the first solution was, I'll sort things in the node one, then I transfer it, and again I sort it. If I come back and think about the supply chain model, and I transfer this sort, directionally correct sort, to a customer, I said, a customer, I know I don't want you to sort per addresses in Montreal or in Quebec. What I want you to tell me is, if a mail needs to go towards east, you bucket them together, and you dispatch it from your facility rather than us bringing it to us. So right away, you basically what you did was, you take the, you replace the sort, dispatch, and sort with a dispatch and sort. So because the sort not happening in the customer. So instead of I put the mail into Toronto, it takes six hours, I would be able to go six hours earlier. Now I arrive six hours earlier to Montreal by, by doing that deal. And then you can share that benefit with the, with the customers. That's what I mean like, a, supply chain collaboration or intermodal design. So I was able to transfer the capacity of the shift three operations in Toronto between 1800 and midnight to a shift one operation in Montreal between midnight and 4 a.m. by doing that game. And, read, and load level my process across the network. Everyone says, okay, so we have, a, we have a perfect solution for it, so we can do that widely everywhere. Then all types of challenge will come to the place. What is the threshold of applying that strategy to the customers? I cannot just I cannot tell the customers to do this store pay for the truck when they have less than a truck. 
then some customers will come back, oh, I can have the list and a little truck. I can have a full truck, but it will happen every other day. They will come with the same situation. It's because you want to do this to decrease the cost. I can come back and say, then, okay, how am I going to compensate customers by doing that? A customer that is already having a small margin. So I'm going to go give a more discount to the customer that is already not contributing to my profit a lot. So how am I going to motivate them to do this job for me? How am I going to justify customer to build an infrastructure that can help me to, to do these types of sort for me? And how am I going to distribute the benefit accordingly between them and us? So all those types of questions are going to come to the attention of people that, okay, how am I going to make this work? In general, what we decided to do was, i go back to the same one, I don't have the slides here, but In general, what we thought could be a possibility is applying a concept called revenue management. So I have to build a solution for the customers in order to be motivated to use a different mode of transportation, different mode of delivery, be able to justify a truck, justify an air uh, use, and not increasing my cost at the same time. So I come back in a very generic way for this case. I'll come back and say that, okay, I'll protect the capacity for a certain window for the customer that is coming from Toronto and try to secure that capacity for them, but, but with the condition that it arrives later than the requested time, I will have them subject to an extra day and don't process that many. So if they are not able to manage their disruptions, I will be able to sort of uh, not transfer that disruption or protect my capacity and not transfer the disruption to my other processes that I have in the network. But I want to go and expand this concept more and more. And thinking through the fact that, going back to the problem that we discussed at the beginning, which was around how am I going to make customers to pay more for their delivery. And the challenge that we have here now is, is there, there are two methodology to make the e-commerce business as a sustainable business. One of them is reducing the cost with the optimization. The second one is justifying a more, justifying to uh, more uh, revenue per item. That means that how the service, how am I going to, how Amazon can or Canada Post can convince me that I pay for my delivery. When I go online, instead of picking the free delivery option, I'll say that yeah, I want to, I want to go and pay for my Prime account of $90 or $100, and I'm willing to pay $10 per item for delivery, and I'll be happy about that. In the other industry, like a hotel industry or airline industry, that's the way to, they manage their capacity in general, because they're not going to build their capacity based on 95 percentile demand. What they're going to do is, when they reach the peak time of the year, they create a boost of their price. You go to a resort, you want to go for Christmas time, being in a resort in Cancun, you pay three times more than the, if you go at October or September. If you want to take a flight uh, between Toronto and, and Vancouver uh, on the 24th or 23rd of December, you will pay $2,000 per trip, and you're going to have it outside that window, and like in a normal day, you'll pay like $500. So there is a, there are a, there is an element into those industry that it doesn't exist in the e-commerce. Because think about it, in e-commerce we tell you guys that, hey, by the way, it's peak time uh, if you want to buy shopping, if you want to do, if you want to do online shopping, and you want to have it delivered between 15th of December and the 25th, you pay $50. That what's going to happen is people automatically move from online shopping to buying their product at stores instead of paying online. But in the e-com, but in the post, but in the service, in other service industry like hotel and airline, you don't have that choice because people say, okay, I'm not going to travel, I'm going to travel later. 
but I don't have an opportunity to replace it, I'll replace my time with another time slot. In the e-commerce, you cannot do that because you cannot say, okay, I will buy it, I will not buy it for the Christmas gift 25th and get it at 25th, I will get it at the after Christmas and deliver it after Christmas. That's why I just make it cheap. So it will erode the, it will decline the volume if we go with that approach. The second problem that you have is the distinguishing between the services that we are offering. In the, post, in the airline industry, in the hotel industry, you have the bucket for your product. There is a, when you go to the plane, there is a seat in front that has a, that has, is more comfortable, it comes with the meal, and there is a seat in the back that it doesn't contain that. In the hotel industry, you have suites, you have junior suite, then you have a normal rooms, they have an ocean view, you have a, a normal view or without view, pool view, etc., 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 that can help us to distinguish these two elements in, with each other. In the delivery problem, you cannot that simply distinguish the services that you're providing with the, for the customer. Or if you can, it comes with the cost. Think about it, your fulfillment facility of the Amazon is in Mississauga, Toronto. They go to the order list and they take it out, one after each other. They pass it on to Canada Post. And they, can, they tell Canada Post, look, there is a one that has a tape of time on it. I want to get delivered tomorrow. And there are the ones that they don't have that prime label on it. I want it delivered in two days to make sure that the services are distinguished from each other. But then that means that I'm holding things somewhere. And that means that there's cost associated to that. Because nobody has a warehouse to keep product. The only place that we can keep product unlimited is in the house of the people. So how am I going to hold mail and how am I going to hold parcels? How am I going to distinguish parcels from each other and at the same time be able to, to, dis to differentiate the service and in order for the people to feel the difference between services to motivate them to pay for the, uh, to pay for the product? Another, uh, in the traditional postal organizations, the only, the only means or the only tool that they had in order to distinguish the service was the air versus ground. But in the real world, everything they needed fast. So more or less everything gonna go air, more and more and more and more. And, but at the same time, how can I have one air cheaper than the other air? <laughs> And then you come back to the other elements involved. Then the, then the questions become, okay, so I have to find the solutions that I can distinguish the product differently, and I can differentiate the service I'm going to justify people to pay for it. In order to do that, I need the technology to be involved more and more. Different mode of the delivery should come into play, but these different mode of delivery shouldn't come at extra cost. Actually, it should slow things down Delivering fast is easier than delivering slow. To slow things down, but at the same time, it materializes the same. That's one element. The second element comes in is, I have to invest heavily on my forecasting model in order to be able to use the road by predicting the service, the order will happen. So I know the fact that, okay, the order will happen in three days in that region. I'm gonna ship it on road. When it arrives there, I don't need to pay for the for the air to to deliver it. It's uh, and that's a that's more or less the the problem from the supply chain <laughs> that I'm working on these days. In order to figure out that distinguish, uh, figuring out that the differences. And I think uh, when uh, Matt Gallaret talked to me about it, and I said that okay, yeah, this problem is a is a high level problem from industrial engineering perspective. But ultimately, the solutions is not in industrial engineering. Those differentiation needs to come from the transportation and logistics environment. So I think the solution will come from these types of research that you guys are conducting here in order to just make it more practical and be able to ultimately distinguish the services from each other to be able to justify a a um, higher rate for the customers that are willing to pay for the, the product. 
So more or less that's it. And if you have any question. <laughs> challenge that we have or that exists in this market is the transition time. Okay? We need to, Amazon needs to get money and invest it heavily in the research and development. Because they are working for distinguishing those services. That's why they went for the prime account. And in order to define those, those elements that can distinguish services and justify people to pay, they need to heavily invest in their research and development activities that they have. So there's no money that you can spend it on an efficiency that exists in the two-day postal organizations and say, oh, you guys, I know you don't like your, your uh, you know, you cannot like uh, cut your labors. You have a unionized environment and etc. Cetera, et cetera. You have old equipment, and uh, you know what? We pay for this, and I do agree there is a margin there that can be paid, but that will, that money will not resolve the problem anymore for them because ultimately. The lead time is defined based on the letter mail volume in this organization. And if the letter mail volume keep going up 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, 5%, you reach a point that nobody can pay the cost. Even Amazon margin that today is quite healthy will not be able to recover the loss that you have in the, in the postal organization because of the inefficiency that exists. So the whole game is how much I pay to this postal so at the same time that we retain the service. At the same time, we are in the growth mode still. It's not stable, the business. So I cannot charge customers crazy to get money out of them. So that's a cap there, too, because we have to pollute the customers that, OK, you know what, if you pay $15 even for your delivery, nothing happens. The first time we got an iPhone, it was all $700 for an iPhone. It's a lot of money. Now, like $1,000 is OK, I'll pay for it, because you're more dependent on the system. Then, within that lead time, you try to find a solution that can make the business more sustainable before the systematic cost subsidization that exists in the system because of Letterman be totally removed. So that time, yeah, I do agree that potentially in the longer time, in the longer range, you will be able to pay more to the, to the carrier to deliver. But in this window that is very sensitive and we are in the disruption mode still, in the S-curve, in the growth factor, the growth involved, then you cannot spend the money for the for the for the inefficiency that exists, or or reinventing <laughs> the network that we know that potentially cannot answer the needs of the future e-commerce. But there's other there's other scenario there too. This is if we look at the problem from private sector perspective. The other aspects is if I look at this problem from the public sector. If I, if I see e-commerce as a service to the Canadian society that is a first world country, okay? Like a low mortgage that you get, like free health, like a low school fee. Now we say that, hey, Canadian, uh, you will be subject to receive your parcels or online, your shopping at your door because government wants to help people to live better. Then at that time, then government has to put his hand after, for now, letter mail pays for it, but there will be a point that government puts his hand in his pocket, put two to three billion dollars every year on the table for, in order to provide that service to the Canadian. And that means ultimately will come from our pocket because of the tax. That's another way of looking at the problem. So either way, we, either way, if you go back from Amazon perspective, is even if a Canadian government wants to do that in future, or US government wants to do that in future, I'll better off to spend all this money for R&D, because then at that time, I will have a healthier margin, and I'll get all the share of that margin in my pocket. If you're looking at it, oh, it's going to go a private, we'll say that, OK, 
I will share in future a little bit more with the carrier, but still I will pay for this R&D in advance and I will reduce my dependency on this carrier. So I don't think there is, for a short term period, till we reach that point, there is a, there is a lot of money involved in the, in the, to invest in the postal industry and expansion of that. And one thing I can say is, because I mentioned about the, the revenue management and then the story of the peak planning and the other service industry versus postal, just to know how much stretch we have to do on the network or the peak versus non-peak period. Canada Post in summer time period delivers around 750,000, 800,000 or so on average day. During peak season, we are at the 2.5 million, 2.4 million. So you're talking about a network that should stretch up three times. And investment from the investment perspective, when we want to define an investment, we said, oh, I want to have a network that works 95% of the time. And that 95% that happens in the two months period, the rest of the year is a, is a very flat operation. So again, makes it even harder to, to justify the, the investment. The behavior of the customers today is doing online heavily for a, a Christmas shopping. It's not still doing online everything all across the year. That, would, that makes the life much easier if that habit is existing. Because we've sold out by everything online all the time, so my volume is always high. And in the peak, still you're gonna buy more or less the same amount, so you can build the capacity that much. It's not, we are not there. It's still is considered to a, sort of follows the pattern of the vacations or the traveling. But over there you have a function of the managing the demand with the price. Here you don't have that tool in your hand. Yep. Said about the surge pricing, and I, I couldn't. Uh, I thought it was a little bit off because I think surge pricing is the only way you balance those. those what you're talking about, yeah. you know, it's the same thing as sort of tolling high business. Yeah. You know, you want to move that demand. We're going to better put the opposite where you say there's there's times where there are surge pricing, but that means also the, the, the low times are where you get discount pricing. So that's how you create movement. And you know that, that analogy about the Christmas time, you don't want to pay the extra thirty dollars. Sure you do, because you know then if you go to the mall, the parking lot's gonna be full and it's gonna be horrible. So then that thirty dollars makes a lot of sense to you as a consumer. But off season you go, hey, I'll go to the mall, there's no one there, right? You know, so then if you so that's how that the whole bounce the fact that that time occurs, that's something you have to take advantage of. And, 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 basic economic principles to, to balance things out. That's the only way we've discovered in society to balance surges is to charge. Yeah. You know, and if it, that doesn't work, I, I think it works in e-commerce. It doesn't really not the same, and I think it absolutely is. It's a universal principle. It, it should be. The problem that we have is the solution that exists in order to actually materialize those uh, discounts to a, to a segment in the operation those solutions is not being yet. So in the airline industry, they gradually came to a solution that, okay, I will secure a portion of the airline to have a premium seat in it, and I'll try to push the other seats attached to each other as much as I can, because we understood that that's the nature of the business, and people are willing to pay. When I was a child, not child actually, like 10 years ago, there was a, it was very normal to all the airline provides food when you were sitting, and now at these days, they're cutting it, and people are okay with it. So they find those anchors. The problem is in e-commerce, those anchors are not well defined yet, and it's not the solutions that actually enable you to cut costs in the operation when you use them, they're not well defined, and they're not safe properly. From the user's point of view, there, there's an obvious advantage of the cost of not having to go out and convenience, and that's what's factored into it completely. So that's as a, as a, as a decision when you're buying on stuff online is because it's easy and you're doing it because there's no economic and it comes to your door and you don't have to be there it's beautiful it's yeah. awesome my wife loves it right and it gives her a lot more time to do other stuff Perfect. so but look at it from the governmental point of view what if the government just built a subway to a mall right yeah. and now no one's going to the mall anymore so then and you're saying well we should you know promote this as a as a as a right thing that 
we should be able to get packages at the door. That's right. right. You know, but that's the same concept. Then you're, you're kind of cutting yourself off with, you know, if you want people moving around to malls and stuff to buy things on the subway. You know, I don't think you worked in a mall if you have your love that because we're even the TTC using the, the subway will be will be less and people will go to the malls and the buses less. So then you're kind of cutting one hand off to, to help the other. So there's a very slippery slope in doing anything like that. And that's why those basic economic principles of cost must be retained. So that can never be a free service. Like, no, it cannot. It, it cannot. It's just like even when you think of it in terms of transit. The roads and they shouldn't be free either because then we have no economic principles to, to, to manage the, the gridlock and the congestion gap because that's the only way as human beings we figure out to manage these yeah. things. But but when you're in the when you're in the growth mode and there is a there is a big hustle, there is a big competitor in your market which is called Walmart, and they are pushing everything that they can do to keep the people at stores. Then Amazon as a competitor comes to that business and says, okay, how much language do I have? What is my price elasticity of that? How can I play conservative at the same time extremely fast to not let people to go back to store? All this pick up order online I pick up at the store is a counterattack to the Amazon that telling that oh I will deliver at your door. Because they know the fact that if they get your feet there, then you may walk in the aisle and get something else out of it. Never get out. Yeah, you never get out. And that's the principle. So you have a monster like Walmart, which is a guru of the supply chain in the world, that try to push all types of solutions to get people back to store. And you have another one that wants to be as priced uh, competitive as Walmart, but provides the premium service of that you buy it, not only I'll package it for you, I'll box it for you, I'll bring it at your door. And by the way, like in Canada, the service is not very premium. In the States, I was at my cousin's place, while in, he's living in um, Dallas. Knocked on his door, and I was way in, and I said, oh, there's a box on the floor, at the front of the door. And I said, hey, but you, like, you don't want to get your online shopping in? He said, no, that's for return tomorrow, they pick it up. So they just, uh, they just, if they don't want the item, they just put it in the same box, leave it at the door, and the next day the guy will come and deliver it. So you see, it can go forever, like the service that you're putting. The challenge is that period of the time, that you want to convert people, you want to pollute people to use you, and Amazon wants that. One of the things I think of a lot is, is what are the overall effects on traffic or on uh, greenhouse gases are like, by, by, like when, when you go to Costco, Walmart, by definition, you said, you buy a lot of stuff. As a consumer, you're like, well, now I'm going to make sure that this trip I took, the hour I took, drove, blah, blah, is really going to be worth it because I'm going to spread those costs over as many items as I can buy, right? And so that's why people tend to buy a lot of stuff when they go to these places. And that's why retailing has changed from big box to small stores because, like, even the boutique thing is, like, really hard to maintain. All those specialty items are ideal for getting them into. Yeah. So, so you know, in, in city planning, we talk about oh, we want to build, you know, a lot of small retail spaces, but there's just nobody to use them anymore. So, so in terms of reflecting on city planning and, and specifically on the environment, because you know, there is a lot of traffic on the This e-commerce item is taking in the in the final sum is taking a lot of traffic off. But I'm not really sure. Like, like, cause like all these trucks are driving around all the time. So, you know, the the, the the point that is there is, if I leave the product to be collected by individuals, okay, let's say from the green gas emission perspective, I will have to go and make sure that you, myself, her, Laura, Laura, everybody is using a electric vehicle. I may not have, okay. So you use your car all the time, so it's your choice. Okay. When I push that to e-commerce, I can put the guy that does the delivery with electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And then I can manage that always with the most uh, advanced technology. I cannot push the most advanced technology to everybody in the society. So you funnel it to a person that can have an impact. That's why I said that the solution, the differentiation comes from here. 
the logic and subject comes here. I can tell you, yeah, the problem is about the growth and then price elasticity and how we play with it, how we connect the nodes to each other. But at the end, the differentiation comes with the fact that how can I look at this problem, how can I look at this differentiation from autonomous vehicle perspective? How can I look at this differentiation from green gas emission? And funneling it to a specific channel, now that channel is managed. Funneling it openly like that, then everybody chooses their own way to do it. See, one thing about the courier industry is it will never be autonomous because you always need a driver. Yeah. Right? So the autonomous vehicle thing is not going to work for you. Not, not, not 100%, no, because of the delivery it always comes with the... There's a security aspect. There's a security aspect. Yeah, it's all about that balance, that how far we can push the technology to, to up to which level you can bring it. But the parcel delivery, the last part, the last steps at least I can tell you, is always going to be manual. Even the sort of the items are already half manual. Like the semi the robots that pick up items, put them on the sorter, and the robots that they pick it up and with. But still, pulling the items out of the floor space, etc., etc., they're all going to be manual for us. Someone like, like in transit, the last mile is almost a block. Well, yeah, it could be. Okay. Right. I was just suggesting you could do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.